Regional School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note there's no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform, and the public has the access to contemporaneously listen. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have also been provided on the website at timberline.net slash Zoom TRSB. If anybody has a problem, please call 382-6541 extension 3955. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there's anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Kelly Bose. Uh, present, and it's just me and the dog in the house currently. Brian Boyle. Present, I'm alone in the, in the house. Someone expected later. Tim Farah. Present, I'm alone in the house. Stephen Finnegan. Present, uh, members of the family are in the house. I'm alone in the room with the dog. Amy Gentile. Present, alone in the house. Barbara Kishka. Present, alone in the house, except the baby chickens. Sheila Lowe's. Here, alone in the house. Sean O'Neill. Here I'm uh, in my in my house, <laughs> and there's other people in the in the household that are in other rooms. And Kristen Savage, I don't see. Oh, she's going to be late. Okay, we all set. Sorry, I'm trying to set up my other laptop so I can see everything at once. Um, if you could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Sheila, for leading me through that. Well, no, that was Brian, too. I was following Brian's lead. So. <laughs> you guys are stealing it's, me. It's been a week. Keep it's always it. something I get worried about is saying it wrong, and I did it tonight, so I apologize. Well, it happens. There's, All right. there, there's no remedial course for that. <laughs> no. Well, they ask you to sing the national yeah. anthem next. Uh, all right, so uh, we have one set of minutes to approve. This will be the April 15th public session. Motion that we accept the minutes of April 15th. Barbara makes a motion. Is there a second? I second. second. Good. Sheila can take. Sheila seconds. Any comments? Uh, Kat, could you take a roll call, please? Ms. Bose? Yes. Mr. Boyle? Yes. Dr. Farah? Yes. Mr. Finnegan? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. Mrs. Kishka? Yes. Ms. Lowe's? Abstain. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. And no Mrs. Savage? No. no Mrs. Savage. Okay, moving on. Um, Kaylee, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, all right, so from Sandown North, we have that Sandown recently celebrated National Humor Month to advocate for student mental health. Um, three students were selected each morning to read off jokes to the school to start each day off with smiles. And Sandown North also hosted a spirit week before April vacation, um, which consisted of Magical Monday, Tie-Dye Tuesday, Wacky Wednesday, and Sandown North Pride Day. Sandown Central students were recently working on Earth Day projects in which they're writing on ways to support conserving energy and keeping the earth clean. Um, and the pre-K students celebrated the culmination of their fairy tale unit of study with a socially distanced ball. Atkinson Academy grade five students completed the New Hampshire State Science Assessment this past month. 
Um, and Atkinson Academy also celebrated National Poetry Month. Each morning, students were taught a different form of poetry over the announcements. And so far, students have learned about haiku, acrostics, and diamante poetry. Um, and these students are also engaging in writing poetry during classroom writing times. Um, each month, students at Atkinson Academy participate in a healthy food challenge. In April's healthy food challenge, color was green. Students plan their snacks around healthy green food, and the class has the most healthy snacks. Each month wins an extra gym class. And lastly, from the high school, um, Spirit Week was the week before April vacation, which went very well. Um, SATs were recently offered for juniors. That also went really well, according to administration. National Honor Society hosted a grateful week in which students got to write things that they were thankful for and hang them up around TRHS. Um, applications have recently been opened for 2021-2022 Honor Societies. TRHS comeback tour t-shirt raffles are going on weekly for students. Spring games have begun for athletes and are going very well. Um, practice has begun for the spring musical, which will be showcased next week. Three seniors are winning parking spots where the students get to park in front of the building in principal spots um, in a raffle, which teachers are calling park like a principal. The milkmen are continuing their improv performances and lastly, student government elections are underway. Kaylee, can I ask you a question? Just out of curiosity, not at all scientific, but uh, of the students you've heard from, are, are most of them pro getting their vaccine when they're able? Um, I've, I've heard a lot of mixed things from students. Um, I, I don't know. I talked to a lot of people with very different views, so I've heard a lot of mixed feelings about it. I know a lot of people that do support getting it and want to get it, but I've also heard a lot of negative things as well. Okay, just curious. Thank you. What about mask wearing? Um, I mean, obviously, students don't want to be wearing masks no matter what. I think no one really wants to be wearing a mask in the first place, but I think um, the student body tends to be really understanding that that's what's safe at this time. I don't hear a lot of complaints from students about it at all. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for those insights. Uh, before we move on, I do want to recognize Dana O'Gara. She's a new face here. She is coming in as our human resource director um, as Timberlay moves out of SAU 55 to SAU 106. Um, so welcome, Dana. She's been quite busy from what I hear so welcome far. Welcome aboard. Um, okay, moving on, we have six delegates and individuals. Um, sorry, I just wrote the names down. The first one's Ms. Paycheck. Can you and hear Ms. me? Ms. Paycheck, you are on. You guys got me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. When the board met last month on April 15th, one of the agenda items discussed was the music director position. To refresh the memories of those listening at home, earlier this year, the position was posted and then removed from Applatrack. Dr. Farah and other board members had a number of questions, most of, most of which could have been answered by Mr. DeBartolomeo, who was not at the meeting because the superintendent advised him that he did not need to attend. The superintendent was directed by the board to research questions and report back to them. Today is May 6. Presumably, Dr. Cochran has had ample time to answer the board's questions, and yet the job has still not been reposted, nor is it an agenda item for tonight's meeting. I urge everyone in our community who cares about the music program to contact their representatives and the superintendent and ask them what they are waiting for. The PAC and the music program need a director. It will certainly become increasingly difficult to find a suitable program leader if the board continues to delay reposting this position. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, Ms. McDonald. Are you there? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kira McDonald and I'm from Atkinson, New Hampshire. Starting off um, these conversations is always so tough as a parent as we're trying to keep our emotions out of the conversation and stick straight to the data and the science. But the emotional part plays such a big role here. The just in case measure the board has adapted has been incredibly harmful to the emotional well being of my child and some of the children in this community. I think you've heard enough of how we all want the masks off of our children. They are not the walking COVID bombs that they were made out to be in the very beginning. They are at much lower risk and any medical professional can attest to that. 
They are not sick and it's time that we stop treating them like, like they are. We can all agree that we all now, what we know now versus what we knew in August when the guidelines were first developed uh, for our district has vastly changed. We are only a few months into this pandemic and there were still a lot of unknown things. Now being one year into this, there is a light at the end of the tunnel and what we have failed to do is adjust accordingly. The CDC has released information stating that the COVID-19 virus is highly unlikely to be contracted by touching surfaces, yet we're still quarantining papers at the elementary level. Our classrooms still have plastic coverings and our teachers are being told to quarantine things like Valentine's coming into the school. These type of things have been easily overlooked by the board, but they need to be constantly updated. You cannot expect these teachers to uphold unreasonable tasks that aren't backed by the CDC. I would also like to mention to the board the very strict social distancing and constant reminders of putting everybody on their dots has become more of like a prison-like environment and doesn't belong in any school. If the masks are as effective as people believe they have been, we wouldn't, they wouldn't have been required one bit. And to reference the original recommendations of the CDC, it was masks or six feet, not both. In my profession as a hairstylist, we, have, we were one of the first occupations to be opened back up after the lockdown. We have our hands all over other people. We are much closer than six feet and we see different people all day long in a small environment. All of these things go against what your recommendations are for the school. So where are we going wrong? If I can do all of these things safely behind the chair, why is my child forced to play with one toy alone at indoor recess? I would like each one of the board members to take a step back and reread all of the current recommendations. Then take a day in your life where you do all of these things that you are forbidden in school and ask yourself, why can I do these, but the children and teachers cannot? Why am I given the freedoms for, of the world, but I am not given the same freedoms to the children who cannot speak for themselves? And I will leave you with this one profound thought that my six, of my six-year-old daughter. After one monumental COVID meltdown, she said, and I quote, all they care about is COVID. They don't even care about what's happening right in front of them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Scanlon next. Good evening, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you very much, go ahead. Hi, um, Sarah Scanlon from 19 Winesat Drive in Danville. Um, I'm here to talk um, about the uh, music director's um, position. Um, so. Who remembers their favorite band and singer growing up? Who remembers what song they danced to it as their wedding song? How about your favorite songs from a musical? Your favorite theme tune? How about all those kids' songs that we played on repeat in our cars? Music's the soundtrack to all our lives and often music creates lifelong memories. I know that there are many songs that I hear and remember my mum. I'm here tonight to appeal to the school board and superintendent to repost the job opening for the music director at Timberlane Regional School District as soon as possible. I know that this was brought up at the school board meeting three weeks ago. I was, um, has this job position, um, job description been worked on? Has the current director, Mr. D, been asked any questions or consulted for any input or clarification on the job description? This feels like a delay that could impact our kids and the reputation of Timberlane as the desired New Hampshire school for music excellence. This role is the glue, the glue that binds together all the different aspects of the music department. Our kids can start to play a recorder in third grade they can try out string and band instruments in fourth and fifth grade or join the chorus, honing their skills, learning how to make the best sound and how to read music and be disciplined enough to practice at home and after school to improve their talents. Concerts are planned, choral groups formed, musicals performed, many lifelong loves of music are born through this program. St studies prove that students who participate in music consistently perform better in their academic studies. Our school district is sought after by home buyers because of the music program which will help maintain home, our home values. The role of the music director at the Timberlane Regional School District holds the entire program together, a hugely important role, one that has been held by Mr. D without fail for many years. This role is key to maintaining our status as the top school for music education in New Hampshire. Delaying the posting of this job could lead to a smaller pool of candidates and potentially an underqualified successor because this is a job that will appeal to candidates throughout New Hampshire and beyond. This job comes with great responsibility and we have some big shoes to fill. My son just talked about Mr. D playing along with his band practice and the fun they had. We have our first middle school concert coming up for our daughter who also plays in the band. My son is hoping that the marching band can go to Disney during his time as a high schooler. He has already experienced statewide band competitions and jazz festivals thanks to the music program. 
I'd like to have the superintendent update us as parents, alumni and students tonight as to the status of this job posting and give us a date when this job will be reposted and available for candidates to apply. Now is the time when candidates will be looking to see where they were best fit for the next school year and beyond. We cannot lose momentum and focus at this point. Our music programme deserves to be a top priority. Our kids deserve to be a top priority. After all, they are the reason we're all here. I know many of our school board members have had their own children benefit from this program and music excellence. We need to make this about the kids and not about delays and missed opportunities. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you. Um, moving on, Mr. Rosmus. Um, I'm having some technical issues here. It's saying that uh, Mr. Rosmus is on an older version of the Zoom platform. Uh, I don't know if you might be able to uh, check that out and maybe we can possibly put somebody else on. Okay, Ms. Doobie, can we get her up on here? Uh, Mrs. Doobie should be on. She's on. Uh, could you unmute, please? Ms. Doobie, and um, go ahead. We can see you, but you're muted. Here Stephanie, do. There well you go. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, well we can hear you. Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Stephanie Doobie, Danville, New Hampshire. Um, I have a couple of questions for you all. Um, first off, I have a question regarding why the school board meeting, excuse me, why the school board members are meeting via Zoom while the kiddos are currently in school. That would be one of my first questions. I don't understand. I don't understand why you all are meeting via Zoom. So that's my first question to you. My second question um, has to do with masks and um, I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions relative to that. So the first question I have is whether or not the school's insurance policy is going to be covering mask related medical or psychological problems that may result from their requirement of prolonged mask wearing, or if that actually falls under the school board's insurance. So those are some questions I would ask of the school board. Okay, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next person is Ms. Hampy, unless we can get Mr. Rasmus on. Uh, Ms. Hampy is now connected and after she speaks, I'm gonna try again with uh, Mr. Rasmus. Thank you. Good evening, Coral Hampy, Danville, TTA president. When I was in fourth grade, I attended an assembly for an instrument demo and I was enthralled. I thought I chose so smart when I chose a foldable instrument, the trumpet. I was wrong, but I was not wrong about being in band. I played throughout uh, middle school, high school till 12th grade, had many opportunities over the years, such as going to New York City twice and playing taps for our country's heroes at their funerals. Just wanna say thank you for listening to my little whimsy memory of fourth grade. I wholeheartedly support the music program. Our numbers are, our members, excuse me, are aware of the discussions around the music program and we want to make sure our strong support was registered. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosmus is now I can see on the screen. If you wanna go ahead, sir. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, so I have a couple of concerns based on the, the survey that was sent out the other day. You know, it seemed as though uh, we were given the ultimatum to either send our kids back to school or pull them completely based on a mask required uh, question. And then it seemed almost like, so I sent a pretty uh, long email to the superintendent and the human resources director. Uh, and it almost seemed like backpedaling the way the email came out today of, Oh, you know, we weren't saying that. We were saying that if you want your child to attend with or without a mask, then select option one. 
And so, A, I kind of, you know, want to put it out there that it was pretty uncomfortable as a parent to receive the email that basically said, I want my kids to go to school with a mask or I want to withdraw them entirely. So I don't know who oversees your public relations or any kind of editorial that goes out to parents that that state such important facts. But, you know, to me, it was basically straight insulting. It basically said, hey, you're going to do what we tell you to do, regardless of the New Hampshire state mandates. Uh, you know, New Hampshire isn't requiring kids to wear masks in school. In fact, a lot of private schools in New Hampshire aren't wearing masks. And it leads, you know, me personally to believe that, you know, is this something that's government? Is, is it a federal funding thing? Are we what's the story behind the fact that public schools who are paid for by taxpayers and us as parents in the community, why are we still mandating max masks, but private schools aren't? And so I understand that, you know, you can live by the word of the government mandates, but there's no government mandate in place that requires children to wear masks in schools. So to me, it almost feels like it's some kind of advantage to the district or to the individual schools um, over the well-being of the children. And I, for one, have a younger daughter who doesn't want to go to school and she's been remote learning all year because she can't see faces, she can't make friends, she can't see smiles. She is told to stay away from people and to keep her mask on. I also have an older school aged daughter who lost recess the other day because her and her friends decided to take off their masks so they, they could breathe because they were running around. And so the insensitivity from the school district is paramount in my opinion of Timberlane as a whole. And so, you know, we can sit there and say, we need to protect people and we need to wear masks. But at the same time, are we really protecting people by wearing masks? And that is, you know, pertains to the children. And so I personally am pro mask. I wear a mask. I've worn a mask since the pandemic started, but I can't sit here and continue to think that that's a great idea when other schools aren't allowed, aren't wearing masks that aren't funded by anybody except for the parents for the private school sectors um it just seems a little odd to me that we are requiring children to still wear masks when the government is saying that it's not necessary and we're sending out a survey four months before september that basically says you can wear a mask or you cannot come to school and it's four months away four months is a long time so what what was the idea behind sending out a survey like that to parents um you know on such on, on a whim, essentially. Thank you. Thank you. I can't truly speak for the administration, but I think the rationale for the survey is that in the survey, at least my understanding is put out, should conditions exist as they do currently, would you be having your child come back to school? There has been reported through various sources that some children are happy with, with homeschooling or remote learning and would choose to continue that. So that survey was sent out as a planning document and Dr. Cochran, correct me if I'm wrong, with no real intention that you were absolutely going to have to have masks on four months from now. We don't know what the, the situation is going to be. We are just trying to get an idea of what our student population is so that we can adequately plan for our teaching staff for the fall. Is that not the case, Dr. Cochran? No, it is. In fact, I responded to a couple of, of concerns that were similar to that. And I think in some of these are valid concerns. Uh, and, and what I tried to explain was that we have to establish a baseline that says, we don't know where we're gonna be in September. We don't know where we might be in December. We're probably gonna have to have multiple pathways depending on what happens. If we get hit with the Brazil variant and numbers go back up where they were, we need to have a plan ready for that. So this was essentially what you described. This is an attempt that says, if basically we're back in the situation where we are using these same uh, safety protocols because of the situation we find ourselves in, what would your choice be as parents in that particular scenario? So once we start to plan for that scenario, then we start to say, okay, so what are the other scenarios that are more hopeful. So it's really a, a hope for the best, but you have to plan for the worst. And, and so we don't, want to, we don't want to not have a plan for a scenario that would look a lot like the levels of COVID that we've had 
you know, over this year. That has to be taken into place. And we decided to, to survey that now while people are, are in the midst of it, rather than uh, ask them that information in August, which is, you know, two months uh, away from their memories of, of where they were. So what you described, I think, is, is pretty much what we were uh, working on and, and what we're attempting. Here's a step. Here's one of the plans that we have to put together. Uh, as, as I say, hope for the best and, and plan for the worst. Okay, thank you. Um, and then regards, uh, there was a question about meetings. We have been doing remote meetings on the, the first meeting of the month and going in person on the second. Um, May 20th, we just found out, or I found out today, we will be able to use the pack. So we will be in person on May 20th. We can reevaluate whether we want to move our, our other meetings on the first of the month, or the first week to uh, the pack moving forward. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Um, part of the reason that we didn't switch that schedule was that everybody knew what that schedule was. And there are also events that are planned in the pack. So there's no... Um, this was the plan. We, we will be in person on the 20th in the PAC because the event that was there got moved out. All right, so we've already started to talk a little bit about the reopening. In your packets, board members, there is some information on uh, reopening and updates. I don't know if anybody has any particular questions that they would like to ask on that. If not, I don't think that, is there any action? Barbara, go ahead. So as far as the current reopening rather than the one in the fall, um, what are the current CDC guidelines about masks outside? Do, do kids need to be wearing masks outside according to the CDC? Mr. Peterson, did you wanna chime in? Thank you, sir. So, um, the CDC does say six foot or masks. Uh, so the recommendations from the CDC is if you are going to be less than six foot, you should be wearing masks, including outside. Um, you know, so, so right now, the students who, who go on mask breaks outside, they are taking their masks off and they separate out further than six feet. Um, so this, so the recommendation from the CDC is, um, you know, greater than six feet social distancing or masks. Uh, and that is, that is the same with uh, New Hampshire. Uh, and in fact, New Hampshire, the governor uh, is releasing new guidelines that, that are coming out tomorrow that are, are going to affect tomorrow that in essence say the same thing. Masks are still um, are, are a good tool to prevent the spread of this, um, but social distancing is also a good tool. Uh, so it's the social distancing or masks. And what is our policy regarding masks outside starting say tomorrow or when so this goes into effect? There, there's the, the way that the mask, um, uh, protocols are written for the district is in buildings. Um, so there's nothing that says that masks must be worn outside, uh, but it is that idea about the social distancing. Um, you know, so if you're standing out in the middle of a field with no one else around you, um, you know, yeah, you can take that mask off. It's the fact of, you know, getting close to people, getting within that six foot range that the CDC and New Hampshire DHHS is still saying uh, has that, you um, has that idea or has the potential of spread. Thank you. So what are we doing in elementary schools, for example, if I have a fourth grader and I'm out at recess? Lucy? So at all the elementary schools, um, for recess, as Mark said, kids are wearing masks unless they go to the mask area, which is where um, an adult would monitor more distancing and that's where they're taking their masks off. So if they're on the playground equipment and they're closer than six feet, they are still wearing masks. But they are, there are places on their playgrounds that they can be yes. unmasked. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions, questions on that? Um, part of the information that's in here that staff or board mm -hmm. members were asking about was the number of people um, that were still uh, working remotely and that's in there. Brian, go ahead. I guess, uh, Mark, I, I must, because I thought I'll watch an awful lot of lose these days. I have not heard right from the president, right to Governor Sununu. I was on the impression that the masks are not required outside. I haven't heard about this six feet. I, I didn't say that masks were required outside. I'm saying that the guidance from the CDC, New Hampshire DHHS, and 
the, the governor's, um, let me quote, the, the universal best practices says that um, social distancing of six feet or mask. So encourage face mask use or both, um, yes, excuse me, encourage face mask use for those who are required to be within six feet of each other. Um, so it's the, it's the in, there is no mandate per se, it's a recommendation, um, mm -hmm. but it's the, the idea to prevent the spread of it less than six feet. So if, if, if people are less than six feet, both the CDC, New Hampshire DHHS and the governor saying um, the recommendation is to have masks on greater than six feet, then you can remove those masks. Okay, thanks. Because I, I just maybe maybe it's how they I'm hearing this messaging. Because I think what I'm hearing over the last few days is what that I've they, heard recently. Sorry to go ahead, Brian. Well, I, I guess what I've been hearing from the messaging from the White House as well as even Sununa's office today, I, I thought they were talking about. Well, maybe I was listening to it differently. That outside, I didn't hear about. Well, if you're going to be within six feet, you should have a mask. I didn't hear that part. So, so the shift in language that I've heard is relating to if you're in, a, in an area of outside of completely vaccinated people, mm -hmm. um, I think they, they've shifted to that, but this wouldn't be that case because not everybody outside would be vaccinated. Okay, okay Sean. And this would be the same CDC that steered this board, Ron, and made our policies as strict as they are and why our students had not had to deal, deal with remote learning for such a long period of time. To say, if we would have adopted the pediatrics uh, model, we would have been far better off as a district. That is, the, that is what, we took a vote on that. We voted on the CDC guidelines. I noticed I, 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 I voted an A on that one. We voted to adopt the CDC guidelines. Yep. That's what we agreed to at the beginning of this year. Yeah, the rest of the board okay. did. I did not. Well, okay. so Sean's just, just making facts, that just facts. Sense. Well, I'm doing right now is making yeah. what, what it was. We're not going to rewrite history, folks. No, we're not. We're not. All right. Okay. So I think we're done with that topic. Moving on to the facilities update, uh, Mr. Fournier is not here tonight. Um, just a, a second. Just, Was the substitute so, teachers covered under the reopening or is that a separate topic? Did you have a question on it? Right, so I don't know if I can share my screen or I have it, but uh, there, there's a chart there with the absentee rate and the fill rate and our absentee rate is way down, um, but I, I didn't understand what the fill rate meant. Can somebody speak to that? I can speak to that. So um, if you look on the first week of May, this year, 2021, we have a 39% fill rate. So that means 39% of the 66 that were absent was filled. And I gave a, a comparison to the first week in May in previous years. Um, if you look at the April dates and the Mays, we had higher fill rates than we do now. Dana, I'm still a little confused. What, what do you, if you're telling me you had 66 absent and the fill rate was, so does this mean 66 teachers are absent? 66 teachers were absent in the first week of May. And the we filled 39% of that, which of the 66. Then, then what happened to the other 60% of teaching time that's not covered? I can't speak for what's happening at the schools, I'm sure. Um, I bl believe that, that there have building subs in there and pandemic subs. Um, so they may have not be put into ASOP and they might be part of the equation. If, if I could, there's two parts to this, I think, Dr. Farah. Yep, what, go ahead. 
One is if you look at the rate or uh, the number of people absent in, for example, May of 2018, 2018, uh, 19, we're 85 and, and 90. And the fill rates of being able to find substitutes were 73% and 67%. This year, the first week of May, we had only 66 absences and we were only able to fill 39%. So even though our absences are down, our substitute availability is down significantly more than the absence rate. That, that I think is the point. Yes. Okay. Is there a root cause of that? Is there, have you determined why that is? We have started looking at the data and looked at the number of people that we have active in our database. Uh, we're looking at the effectiveness of our, of our system. Uh, right now, you know, we, we post and, and, and uh, uh, people volunteer, sign up for those, those uh, uh, positions. So we're not sure at this point in time whether that's a lack of access, just nobody out there, or if we're not doing the job that we should at, at uh, uh, recruiting people and getting them into our system so that they can sign up for those. Or, you know, if, if maybe the, the, the system itself is um, not working as well as it should. In theory, it's a good system because people can go in and pick the dates, the locations that they want to sub. Formerly, we, we would have a whole bunch of, of admin assistants and administrators calling out, trying to find people and, and calling them personally. That was time consuming and, and, and labor intensive, but fairly effective because we were reaching out to them as opposed to them picking and choosing from home, sitting in front of the computer about whether or not they wanted to take a spot. So we're, we really don't have a good handle on why. We do think that the biggest factor is just a lack of substitutes. We do know that at this point in time, uh, federal estimates are that we're short nationally over a quarter of a million teachers. We know that most school districts in the state have been uh, advertising you know, consistently all year for positions and getting very, very few people just because there's not a whole lot out there to, to, uh, uh, to pull from. So uh, and that's even with the state allowing emergency certifications this year. So you could sign up if you met minimum criteria, you could get certified and we could hire people as, as uh, teachers uh, in, in uh, daily positions uh, that previously couldn't have, and we're still in this shortage. So uh, just a, a really quick question. If I'm looking at my math correctly, there's a total of 579 substitutes total. And out of those substitutes, 218 are active, which, which means 62% of the subs that we have in this district are inactive. What are we doing about that? I, I, what is the mode of communication to these 361 inactive substitutes that would essentially help fill that gap of that 40% or 60% of, you know, the, the, when, when teachers are out, the, that kids are not getting a, uh, level yeah. of the teacher that, there. That's a really good point, Steve. And it's something that uh, HR Director O'Gara and I have talked about. Is it part of the system? Is it just the numbers that are out there? You know, where are we in, in terms of, of comparisons to other districts? And we, we really don't know at this point in time. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort and energy back in the fall into uh, generating those pandemic floater job descriptions um, and, and putting people in that role and we recruited very heavily we were very proactive we emailed anybody who had ever applied and so you know they haven't logged on into our system we reached out to them and said hey you know we're still looking for subs we're still looking for this and, and that and uh i think since we did that big reach out in the fall and had some success we probably haven't gone back to that strategy so that may be something we want to look at but just making people aware that we're here you know, here's here's what the the uh, uh, the daily salary is for daily subs and 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 so on, but uh, we're likely not to have a great yield at the same point in time. If you don't try, your yield is going to be even lower. So, you know, something I think we have to consider. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. Um, so moving on to the facilities update, which is in your packet, and Mr. Fournier is not here 
Uh, we did talk about this a little bit um, last time. Let me just pull up the document here. Um, so we're still waiting on a list of capital equipment replacement recommendations from train. Um, we are trying to get this list together because we're, uh, we do have some capital funds left that we are going to be trying to um, encumber or at least purchase the equipment before the end of the fiscal year. And as soon as we get this, I would anticipate that, that we'll be looking to uh, replace whatever the most critical pieces of equipment. One of them uh, we're still trying to track down on the CIP, uh, one of the unit IDs. So that's, that's going on. Board members, you did receive um, copies of some, or I received copies of some of the work that train has been doing. They began work in the middle school the week of the 15th. They are providing pictures and weekly progress reports of all the work that's performed. Um, uh, Maria and um, facilities went out for RFPs on LED relamping proposals at the energy committee. We talked about that last night where the uh, award is going to Northeast electrical distributors. It's around $215,000. We'll be purchasing some of those um, with this year's money and then moving on and purchasing the rest later. Um, our in-house electrician will be doing the work. We're hoping to get students from the technical school to assist and um, we expect the payback on that is probably three to four years. So that's, that's gonna be work on, going on during the summer. The Sea Power uh, Demand Response Project has been completed. The, it's being metered now. So hopefully we'll see some revenue from that as the summer progresses if they ask us to shut down. And the plant operations position has been advertised and they're looking at applicants and getting together a interview committee and at the end, I'm oh, sorry, Barbara, I'm stealing all your thunder, but this is all facilities. Uh, Mark Fournier is working with um, uh, the National School District to try to uh, learn how they went about funding or working their solar energy pro project. So we have, we'll be continuing to work on that. So that's anything else on facilities update, HVAC update? No, we, uh... We can do the director of plant operations position. Uh, it was posted uh, shortly. Uh, it it uh, it's a posted as uh, you know screening begins immediately, open till filled. Uh, we do have a number of applicants, several of whom appear to to meet the qualifications we've established uh, for that position, and those qualifications for this position are significantly uh, more demanding than than the old. Uh, old title and job description. So we're hopeful to put a, a search committee uh, together. We, uh, Director O'Gara and Mr. Fournier and I have had some conversations and I think we're ready to uh, pull a search committee together and, and start looking at applications relatively shortly. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the athletic training bed. There is ahead, a- Kim, Sheila. Oh, sorry, sorry, Sheila, go ahead. What? I'm just wondering if we can get an update on the in-house um, maintenance on the HVAC. How's that going? Um, actually, very well. Uh, Sarah Vieira has been working uh, school dude and, and updating and, and uh, entering uh, Excel spreadsheets that will allow us to track on a daily basis rather than quarterly basis the work that's being done. Uh, the the work, has, work rate has been uh, pretty high. Um, we are documenting very uh, uh, significantly, including pre and post uh, pictures of, of uh, HVAC equipment that show the, the, the level of cleaning, uh, anything that's replaced, that sort of thing. So we have a database that is, you know, down to the how many, how many devices a day. Uh, we, we have concrete evidence that you know, the coils are being cleaned. So you'll get the air exchange rates that you want in terms of heating okay. and cooling. And, and uh, I would say very significant improvement from, from where we were in the fall. Well, this is both happening in coordination. So that's why I was wondering about that piece. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on the next item on the agenda is the athletic trainer contract. There is an executive summary here. I don't know if uh, Mr. 
Fantasia wanted to speak to this or not. It looks like Exeter Hospital has won this bid because they're actually um, proposed to do our athletic training services for no monetary cost. So that's a big win. Um, yeah. And it would just require us to designate Exeter and CORE as the official sports medicine provider. And there's an, another few things here. Um, the recommendation is for us to acquire those services. So this this does take an action from the board. Yeah, the, I'll make the, that the motion. The in there is is that you know we will provide them with promotional opportunities, uh, and they'll be able to use our facilities to advertise in exchange for the services. So so they are getting some value from it. At the same point in time, uh, we're getting a, a tremendous deal. Okay, Sean, did you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make that motion, but I also want to have a follow up with Dr. Cochran on this last comment. And in, in regards to the, this promotion, is it you, you being the um, superintendent, do you get discretionary over what they're proposing? So, that in other words, we get, they got to get buy in by us? And by us in terms of? You know, I mean, do. It's just, I understand it's the that... promotional aspect of that, but uh -huh. it can't be Sean. really un. un it says that right in the document, Sean. Yeah. Which we understand must be approved by Timberland Regional School District leadership. Yep. So they went out, the, the, the bids were opened, I believe it says on the 29th. Um, and uh, they, uh, the group that, that did the bid was uh, Mr. Fantasia and uh, uh, folks in athletics. And that was a recommendation that they made to me which is why it's on the board agenda. So this is the one that came out of the bidding process as the recommended vendor. Okay, so looking for motion, Kelly. Yeah, oh, I'll, uh, I'll wait for the discussion period, sorry. Well, we are discussing, there's not oh, a motion. I didn't yet. know if it was, had been seconded yet. Um, has this, have we ever done anything like this where we've um, accepted promotion as compensation? I think Access used to get some sort of promotional materials, Mr. Down, or? Yes. They used to pay oh, for pay. some of that exposure as well. Okay. I just actually, it, it they actually used to pay us uh, for that. Okay. And did that offset the amount of their contract? Oh, gosh, no. Okay. No. So, no. And the previous contract was, I, was that around 18000 a year? 29. Yeah, it's like, like 30. Uh, yeah, but just under 30. And I don't think that they ever made money on that contract. So this is a particularly good um, option, very nice right. partnership um, with the district. And I think it's here because this is different than what we've done before. And there, I think there's a lot of value here for Exeter. There's a lot of value here for the district, but the, it would really require some board buy-in to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Sorry, I just, I think it's fascinating. I and, and it's a really interesting proposal. I'm just the, uh, and maybe I'm overthinking it, but designating it, uh, their office as the official sports medicine provider. I just wanna make sure, um, maybe you've had this conversation that like, that doesn't mean that if one of our student athletes goes to a different uh, provider for something that their treatment would be any less or, you know, you know what I mean? I just wanna make sure the students uh, aren't getting the short end of this stick. Nope. They provide our on-campus on athletic training services, and from there, our students can go wherever they would like for any follow-up care that they need, and, and they'd be treated just the same. So if we have an athlete who has a, a slight sprain and needs a particular high-level you know, tape job, those are the sorts of services that are provided on, on site. And then if there's an injury, as, as pointed out by, by Mr. Dowd, people go where, where they want for that service because that's the service that they're paying for. But we're, we're getting you know, the sorts of, of regular training services on site at no cost. Steve, then Barbara. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> it's pretty vague. Well, in my mind, it's pretty vague. It will provide athletic training services. What is what does that mean in in terms of personnel at sporting events that are from um, this the, the Exeter Hospital team? Uh, does that mean that they're providing somebody for each sporting event that will be there? Um, it, it I, I think NHIAA has specific guidelines. 
where I work, we have athletic training programs. So they are required to have athletic trainers on site for practices and also for games. So when they're saying they provide those services, they're, they're gonna to have to provide what's required by NHIA. A rules, right, Dana? Dana's shaking her head, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's, uh, they have to be well aware of those regulate. I know it sounds vague, but I, it is outlined what's required for division one high school. Okay, great. Yeah, those were all included in the RFP, one trainer for middle school, one trainer for high school on campus practices and games. Yeah, so yeah, Steve, this is just the summary. If you wanna see there, the, I'm sure the RFP was, we saw those before quite detailed. If you, if you want to see, question. get a hold of us and we can get it for you. Yeah, right. if you want, if you want it, you can, you can have it. Barbara? My, it was along the same lines of Steve, that the letter was mostly about advertising and very little about what the services provided were. But if, so the services requested in the RFP are the same level we we were getting from our previous provider or? That's the expectation. Okay, so, so we should be getting the same level of service. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, well, I'm all for saving money, but I'm not fond of advertising. We did have advertising with the last one, too. Yeah, that's what they're doing before. Free, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. The last, the last service we had also had advertising on campus. Exactly. All right, still looking for motion. Second. I'll make that motion. John makes it. Brian I'll seconds. See, I heard you, Brian. Okay. Kat, can you take a roll call, please? Ms. Bones. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Kuska. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. And Mrs. Savage, do you know when you got here? <laughs> A few years ago. About. 7.45, I would say. Thank you. <clears throat> so she owes everybody dinner because she was late. Um, all right, Please moving on me. to legal, <laughs> legal counsel record. Um, we tabled the appointment of legal counsel at the reorg meeting. I'm recommending that the board seek legal counsel as necessary and with the appropriate firms and I'm going to request that the board authorize uh, the chair to engage with such legal firms as needed. So moved. Sean second. gets the first. I second. Barbara got the second. Yeah. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd like to see if we can have a lawyer law firm out there, Kim, that'll put like the athletic director. We'll give them all the ads they want for free. They will. <laughs> I second that. Man, if yeah, only. No, for sure. Okay. Uh, Kat, could you take a roll call vote on that, please? Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Great, thanks. Next item is administrative hiring update. I know we already talked about plan operation director. The Did other things we've, we, we have brought in a uh, new uh, hire for the principal at the high school is John Vacareza. And I know that he is actively working with both district and uh, school administration to start to, to get into the school, meet people and so on. He was introduced to the staff earlier uh, in the last few days and was has started to set up meetings and trying to, to begin uh, the onboarding process and getting to understand and building relationships with people very early uh, as, as much as he can. And uh, we support that 100%. Uh, Mr. Steve Harris is, uh, has been hired at, at uh, Atkinson Academy. And uh, we've also had conversations about or onboarding and the ability to, you know, get in and meet people. And we're working on that process. And the third that's already in place is uh, Director O'Gara, who started on the 19th of this month. And she's been, I think, busy enough since she started. So 
very glad to have, have Dana on board and we'll be very much looking forward to the other two. Ongoing searches we do have for the Director of Plan Operations, Assistant Principal at the Middle School and uh, Director of Student Services uh, slash Pupil Personnel ongoing. And the Music Director? Not posted at this point. And what are we waiting for? I'd like to um, actually have a discussion in non-public in regards to that, Barbara, personally. Okay. All right. All right. Moving on then. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, next item on the agenda is the audit update. Uh, oh, yeah. board members, you'll see that there's an update here on the audit. Sorry, my, oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm looking, I've got two computers. I clicked the wrong one. All right, so I did, I, the SAU audit for last year is in its final, final stage. Maria, that's correct. And you're working on the other two on the current Timberlane audit. Yes, so the fiscal year 20 audit for SAU 55 is actually in the very last stage, in the, best part, in the very final stage. We are hoping to get the financial reports soon. Uh, the auditors are currently working in another three audits. Our uh, Timberlane fiscal 20 audit is progressing. Uh, we are providing all the schedules and all the information that the auditors are requiring. Um, and we are hoping to get that one done before the end of the year as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions on that? All right, moving on. I guess um, still up on finance, anticipated surplus is next on the agenda. Board members, I think there's in your packet, there is a 2021 projection of approximately 2.1 million. Are there any qu questions on that, Sheila? No, nope. I'm just the wheels are turning. That's all. No. Okay, I just saw your I little. Just, I just want to know that I just want to know that is two point one plus the the fund retention, which is five hundred thousand. So it's two point six. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Question. Now, does that include the the ESSER money? Where's that ESSER money sitting? So that includes part of the SER money. Uh, we are including 450,000, which is uh, the money that we had already spent uh, for the train or the, the work that train has done. And we are actually projecting some for the pandemic floaters that we're gonna have in these last months of, of school. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have provisions for that. As of now, obviously the remaining of the money is still available, but I did not include it because we don't know yet what is gonna, what are we gonna be using for equipment if we're gonna be using any of that money for equipment this year. Okay, thank you. I just want to give a shout out to the financial department for chasing down all those grants because a, a fair chunk of that money is is grants. Yep. And, and and things like that. So thank you for doing the paperwork and chasing all that down. It's, it's been a busy year and, and there have been opportunities and the information flow from the DOE has not always been quick or accurate. Uh, and I know Maria and, and other people uh, have had to spend a lot of time in the Zoom meetings, uh, Jeff involved as well, in order to make sure that we're compliant and able to, to use the money in, in an appropriate way. And despite everything else going on, I, I think we made pretty good use of, of, of that money. And it's really springboard us in terms of the facility size. I, I just want to thank people for their hard work on that in the midst of all the normal things that we'll be doing on and on top of it. So thank you. Correct. I agree. I would like to note, if I can, that you'll note on that schedule that it does not include really any any capital projects, um, balances, surpluses, or anything like that. <coughs> Currently, we have a balance um, to be spent in that. In that, in those accounts, in between the 4,600 and 4,200, about 250,000 or so, and perhaps more if we can get more into the grants that we have right now. So we're still waiting for guys.
that we will be spending those funds, again, a, a couple hundred thousand dollars additional. So this doesn't mean that we're out of money. We, we, we're, we're, we're still showing $200,000 available, at least, if not more. And we in, intend or expect that those will be spent or committed prior to June 30th. So we've already looked at that and, and removed those. So this 2.1 reflects the fact that we anticipate spending an additional 200,000, at least, if not more. Okay, great. Yep. Good to know. All right, any other questions on that? All right. Um, next item on the agenda is school board goals. Um, board members, I was just looking at the packets. I did not get a chance to get this uploaded into the packets. I did just send out some draft goals this afternoon. I would appreciate it if people could take a look at those and, and add or um, amend those. Um, I do actually want to run those by the superintendent because before the next meeting and probably redraft those and actually run them by the new HR director um, and the new CFO, Maria, so that we can ensure that our board is one in line with with the senior administration as to what the goals are for the coming year. And two, be supportive as much as we can in terms of getting the board uh, you know, to work together with that senior leadership team. So I, I will try to, I, my schedule should be free here, freer here in the next week or so. And I'll set up a meeting and, and try to work with those people um, to get some more insight just for the board. We, we have not had a chance to sit down and discuss. So maybe we'll spend some extra time on that next time. Um, the, there's a couple other things in the packet um, and I don't think we need to go over those. Uh, because we have bargaining units, you'll see about one, two, three, four um, items in your packet about the um, intent to negotiate by I don't know, Dana, you could, by statute or whatever, they, they, the bargaining units need to notify us that they want to negotiate their contracts. Since we have three one-year contracts, those need to be negotiated. And then the TTA, which is a three-year contract, is also going to start to be negotiated over the course of the coming year. One of the things I failed to mention is that one of the, I was reading the school board goals, and one of those was to invite the TTA and TSSU in to a board meeting at some point over the course of the last year. I just wanna let the board know that I did do that at least on one occasion, I think maybe more than one, and they have declined our invitation to come to the board meeting. So just wanted to let board members know that. Um, so that's that's that on the goals. We'll, we'll try to spend a little bit more time on them later. Um, Dr. Cochran has an administrative report. I think we talked about, well, the copiers you can speak to, and then we can go into the personnel report. Uh, the intent to negotiate, you've covered the hang, new professional. Hang on, Dr. Cochran, Barbara. Yeah, so Dr. Fair, I've noticed that Coral Hampy has been attending the meetings, you know, at least maybe not as a participant, uh, except as a, a public speaker, but she has been here. Uh, correct, she's been coming to delegates. Yeah, but she it's also- not the same that. as, as attending and having a back and forth with the school board. Okay, thank you. I mean, we invited them to come to part. I mean, delegate session is usually limited to three minutes. This was an opportunity. And in the past, say a couple of years ago, I, this is not kind of the time to do culture and climate, but they, they do surveys periodically and then come to tell the board if what they perceive as, as you know. We've been doing this chance. multiple years and they have declined. I've invited them when I was the chair. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Cochran, you wanna do the administrative report? Yep. So we've done the intent to negotiate. You've covered that, Dr. Farah. The second item is a new professional position in discussing uh, service providers. We determined that uh, we have had a part-time uh, so school psychologist for the last several years. And because it's a part-time position, the hourly rate is higher. And we determined that in this last year at 77%, the amount of money we were paying a part-time person was higher than our full-time people were making. And so this would actually be an increase of service and a cost saving at the same time. So the recommendation to 
uh, approve the change of that position from a contracted service hourly to a full-time position, resulting in a, a savings and increase uh, services at the same time. So you're looking for a motion from the board? Question with the superintendent there, Kim? Yep. So Brian, when you say that, are you, when you say it's a savings, are you also factoring the, the benefits package? Uh, yes, actually, I believe so. Because it's gonna say that's that's probably worth yep. about 60 to 70,000 on top of that. So uh, not, well, not, not that much. Family plan it's, plus retirement, of course it is. Yeah. I believe Maria and Jeff, we did do the, the math on that, I believe. Yes, no? I, I was not asked to do the math, so yeah. I don't know. All right, well, well wanna, I think what the board would- the next meetings until we can yes. get some numbers on it? What I, the for the next meeting, yeah. could we just have a summary sheet as to what the cost was this, this yep. year, what you anticipate the cost with benefits would be? Should we move this to a full-time position? And I'd also like to know from the CFO's position or where, where this goes as a budget line. So we can see it in the, cause that's gonna, I, I just wanna see where that line item is. If you could just mm -hmm. give us a budget line item number for it. Sure. So when we make the, the change, it's by line item. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Next is the copier and printer contract. Marie, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, sure. So the district recently completed the RFP for our copiers. So the current situation of our district is um, we have we have been replacing copiers at a piecemeal. So we don't have a schedule for the copiers that we have in the district. We have over 400 copiers and printers in the district. So right now we have um, six different manufacturers and 63 different models of copiers and printers in the district. So as you can imagine, the management of those of that equipment is extremely time consuming and hard. Right now, uh, all of our copiers are out of warranty and they are starting to fail. Uh, so the maintenance expense for these copiers and printers is gonna escalate as we go. So this um, RFP, this process that we went through came out actually with very positive outcome. Uh, it is going to allow us to replace all the copiers and printers in the district for the same amount that we are currently spending annually. So we're gonna get all new copiers and printers and including the, the, the black and white and the color prints as well as um, a new, <clears throat> uh, software that will allow us to monitor and analyze the printing patterns. So it will help us to improve the, the quantity of, of printing that we're doing and, and manage the, the printing. It will also have a, have a feature where that you have to swipe your, your, your ID to get the print, the actual printing. And if you don't, it goes into a queue that gets deleted after 24 hours if you don't release the job. So it will help us to save on that as well. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Maria, we have a very expensive uh, toner maintenance contract and, and some other copier related contracts, I believe. Does this have any effect on those? Yeah, th those are gonna be done. So we're, we're not, we, we're not renewing, we already told the company that we're not renewing um, the service. It is extremely expensive. So this new, this new agreement would allow us to change, to have all the copiers and printers within the district where we're gonna have only a couple of models. So it's gonna be a very uniform uh, system and the price of the, of the price per copy is significantly lower, which is gonna allow us to be able to have the equipment, to list the equipment so for the same really amount. Clear. Thank you, Marie. Mm -hmm. our, our maintenance costs are so high because our machines are so old, if that's a good way to put it. And so we'll have newer machines with warranties so the maintenance costs drop precipitously. They, they really go down. Maria, this is great news and it's long overdue. Uh, thank you for doing all this stuff. 
if you could also reach it out to me, to, you know, over the next couple of days, because I like to actually tell you exactly what we do at, at the town level. And I think that you might be actually surprised in what, what the cost is for our town. Uh, it's very, very economical. And it's the same thing with, with the, the trickle down of the copiers. We've moved, we've gone through now, since I've been on the board, I think three complete lease terms of copiers. And we just keep on moving them down to different organizations. And we pay a maintenance on that. And it, it includes the toner. It includes staples. It includes a bunch of different things. So just to make sure that you're getting all the bang for the buck, you know, for the district, uh, you know, looking at what the town's getting right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. So do you need a motion on this right now, Maria? Yes, please. All right. I'll uh, make a motion to adopt the agreement between Timberland Regional School District and MST governing leasing. I'll second that. <laughs> Okay. The only thing I would like to suggest as a recommendation is that is now it's locking us into that one vendor for the motion is I'd like to maybe back out the vendor's name and, and leave it as a, a lease agreement on favorable terms versus having a specific vendor, because then if we find out something should be a, a different vendor should come out and uh, come forward, there might be uh, a, a different outcome instead of waiting for another board meeting. No, I, th I, th I thought we were already engaging this vendor, though. Hey. Yeah, the agreement is with the, well, we did the, the RFP and is, yeah, the agreement is for what they are offering us. It's, it's with this vendor. So I don't, I don't understand why we back the vendor's name out, Sean. My understanding is, a, is that, uh, Ken and, and our business folks have have worked on the comparable costs, and and this was a vendor that that came forward essentially as as uh, the best match for our needs and price point. Right. So the RFP already went out, and this is the vendor that they're recommending. Done deal. I agree. All right. It's done. Then it's a done deal. Then. All right. Okay. So I made the motion. Did I get a second? Yes, you did. Yeah, Barbara, uh, Barbara seconded. Sorry, Barbara. I, yeah, I. <laughs> yeah, can you take the roll call on that? Miss Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yep. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Tushka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just looking through other stuff in this. There, there's also, um, is that it for the administrator's report? Did we wanna move on to the personnel report, Dr. Cochran? We had uh, two, 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 two. Uh, other informational items. One was the press release update. update. I just wanna thank Kathy Belcher for the nice press release on the two, uh, announcement of the two uh, new principles, and there is an executive summary on the year-end events. Uh, other than that, that's it for the administrator's report. We do have some items on the personnel report. Okay, and, and sorry, does the middle school need uh, approval on the end-of-year events, or are we all okay to go on that, Brian? These, they were run through SLT, we discussed options, and uh, I don't believe we need school board approval. Uh, we've run them through our normal uh, procedures. Okay. Uh, Sandy, Mark, and Lucy, past practice has been that SLT has, has, has uh, vetted those things, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure they were set to go and they didn't need something from us. Well, from the team from the middle school, I want to say thank you because it looks like it looks like a great end of year activity schedule. So thank them for the hard work. They've, they've worked hard, they've been busy, but yeah, I, I think, you know, all of our schools have done a really good job of trying to, yeah. to you know, keep kids engaged, keep them uh, uh, working and learning and at the same time, recognizing that the amount of things that were lost this year. And so I think mm -hmm. there was a special effort this year to try and even though the, you know, the typical Canopy Park stuff and things like that may not be doable, 
uh, they really wanted to try and, and have a, a, a nice finish. And I believe yeah. the high schools is, is in a very similar mindset as well as the elementary schools. So despite, despite the challenges, I think all of our schools are committed to having, having you know, a memorable ending to the school year. So yeah. I want to thank them for that. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the personnel report, and um, I do want to point out that there is one retirement here that they've asked not to make this public knowledge. So we are going to want to accept that retirement in a non-public session for now. Okay. Did Did you want me to go through the nominations, Dr. Cochran, or did you? No. If you If you'd like to do that, that's fine. Okay. So there are three professional nominations. The first is for Brooke Belmont, occupational therapist at, I don't, I don't know think there's a, excuse me. I don't think there's a specific school, is there? Okay. okay. This is occupational therapist, Jason Cucolo, Pollard School Counselor, and Clyde Perez Castaneda. Uh, Perez Castaneda? Perez Castaneda? Right. High school special education. I would teacher. say Ada. Yes. Sorry. It's... So I'm looking for a motion to accept those three professional nominations. I will make that motion and I'm not going to repeat the names because I will crucify it. Okay. So. Second. A second. Steve seconds. Kat, can you take a roll call vote? Miss Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Pusha. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Then we have uh, one retirement, Rebecca Leitzer from Pollard School, our teacher. It's been um, with the district for nine years. Go ahead. I make Joel. a uh, motion to accept the retirement of Rebecca Leitzer um, and thank her very much for her service and we wish her the best of luck. Thank you. Second? Second. Second. I think Kristen seconds. Kat, can you take a roll call on that, please? Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Ms. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Great, thank you. And then we have two resignations. Um, a professional resignation, Elizabeth Bisbing from Atkinson Academy Special Ed Teacher. And the Sandown Central Principal, Jen Marino, is also resigning. I'd like to make a motion to accept the resignation of Elizabeth Bisbing and Jennifer Marino. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. First and seconds. Um, sorry, could we have a roll call vote, Kat? Ms. Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Ms. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is committee reports. Um, I'm just looking through my screen, top to bottom. Kristen, do you have anything? No, Barbara? You stole almost all my thunder. I, I am, oh, so sorry, sorry. You can repeat it just for good measure. Well, I, I will say that the Energy Committee did receive five responses to the RFP for the LED lighting. We accepted the lowest bid that had uh, adequate, that, that, that conformed to the requirements. It was a New Hampshire company, Northeastern Electric. The other companies were significantly higher and from out of state. In addition to the LED lamp relamping, which we're really excited about, and I'm really uh, want to thank Mr. Steve Paradis for all the effort he's putting in in uh, making sure this comes to fruition. The LED lamping, um, thank you to him. 
And then uh, another thing that we'll be working on is replacing the aerators in the hand sinks in the schools. Uh, our Mr. Fournier said that if we replace the aerators, the little things that go in the faucet, we can reduce the water use in the hand sinks by about 75%. And we're also saving money on the water, you know, the amount of water that's not heated and moving that amount of water. So that's, that's a really low cost solution that I believe we'll be moving forward with. Tim, I don't think we need any uh, motions on that because that is well below the, the amount, right? Right, yeah, it doesn't need to go out to bid or anything. Okay. But we also encourage people out there in the district uh, to get those little aerators, put those in and, and reduce your, um, say, save energy and, and water. Okay, thank you. Um, back to Kristen, you said you had something? I do, just picking out a couple minutes. Um, two things, um, I wish I had more news on all the other sports, but I wanted to apologize for my being late tonight, but I was at the lacrosse game tonight. And I just wanna um, say that, you know, both the boys and girls both had victories tonight and which was nice for both teams. They're, they're playing, they're, they're working through all of this. The athletics all seem to be going um, quite well. They're, they're doing well with keeping the kids with um, restrictions with COVID and masks and the spectators are all being very respectful and everyone appreciates the fact that they're able to play. Um, that being said, a lot of our games are live streamed and people should be checking out the Timberlane um, website on athletics to get information to watch the games. The boys varsity lacrosse game tonight was lucky enough to be broadcast by um, Friday Night Lights New Hampshire, which um, it's on demand to a lot of these games so you can watch them after the fact if you can't make them. Um, but it's, 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 I guess, a positive to come out of COVID for a lot of our athletes that their games are being live streamed and, and put out there. So they're having fun um, with all of that. So I also would like to say that our lacrosse coach will also be a guest on Friday Night Lights this weekend. Um, so if anyone wants to hear Coach Blaska be interviewed, that will be happening this weekend as well. Um, and that's all free access. And one other thing is the Run of the Savages has been going on. It's been a virtual event this year for 10 days. It ends on this Sunday, but if anyone is interested in it, it is on the Pollard website and the links are also on the school websites as it is a Pollard event that raises money for the um, Jimmy Fund at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So thank you to everyone that has participated to date. You still have through Sunday night to participate if you're interested. And that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sean, do you have anything? No, Kelly? Uh, I'll defer to Amy as co-chair. Okay, uh, Amy? Um, I have an update from the curriculum committee. Um, we will be providing, or they will be providing um, a revised uh, high school business course documents to the board for an upcoming meeting. We've spent um, some time reviewing those. Um, they're working on final edits right now. And there's a, been a ton of work done by the teachers and by the dean to align the standards and competencies with the courses. Um, some kind of exciting um, courses are lined up. Uh, definitely things I would have taken advantage of in high school that were not offered then. Um, so that was really interesting to see. Um, and another really awesome point that was brought up at the curriculum committee was a survey that was sent out to staff asking them um, what positive changes have you implemented and or observed throughout the pandemic. And it was really um, a uh, kind of when it rains, look for rainbows kind of a moment to look and see some of those survey results and things that were brought up, everything from more connection with families and being able to have parent-teacher conferences and IEP meetings with both parents attending to virtual staff meetings being more efficient to choice and PD time and more student-centered learning. So I thought it was a really great thing to spend some time looking at um, really um, hopefully lasting positives that, we, that we've seen come out of the pandemic. So uh, great conversations at the curriculum committee. Great, thank you. Um, Sheila? Nothing? Don't have anything. Uh, just a quick update on the policy committee. Uh, we met uh, right before this meeting. Uh, I believe there are, looking at my notes, uh, five uh, policies that are being pushed, uh, moved forward. 
uh, for review uh, and uh, that's it. Okay, so well, we need to put on the agenda for the next time, those five policies? Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, Brian Boyle? I don't have anything. Nothing, okay. So if no one else has anything, I'll be looking to enter into a non-public session under 91A colon three paragraph two C. So moved. Second. Do we have a sip? <coughs> Do we have a different Zoom link for this? Uh, yes. Did, did, just we, did, we, did we just get a new? Just sent it. Just, just, just sent it? Okay. okay. Um, and Dean, can you make sure Dana Aguirre and Brian Cochran and Kat Lancaster on that? I think that's that's all that we need on that. I Dana, do not. Verify. Just, excuse me. I will. I will verify that they were on the list. Okay, great. Uh, I don't anticipate coming back into public session other than to just close out the meeting. Yeah, Dean just sent the link out two minutes ago, so it should be in your inbox. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see you in a few weeks. We need a vote. Uh, yes, we need a vote. Thanks, Kat. I was just getting ready to do that. Um, did we get a, did we get a motion in a second? I yes. Oh, she okay. I was the second. Oh, John was the second. Um, okay, Kat, go ahead and take the roll call, please. Miss Bose. Yes. Mr. Boyle. Yes. Dr. Farah. Yes. Mr. Finnegan. Yes. Ms. Gentile. Yes. Mrs. Kishka. Yes. Ms. Lowe's. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Mrs. Savage. Yes. Okay, great. So we'll leave this meeting and go back to the, uh, get on the other Zoom link. Thank you, everybody. All right, good night, everybody.